Okay, we are rolling, by the way. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Chalupa for you, Rish. Get a paper bag, everybody. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. When I'm, and I'm confused. Why did you say get a paper bag? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, no, no, just a moment ago, right before you said welcome, it sounded like you said get a paper bag. So I, I, I didn't say anything like that. I don't know what you're saying. Well, what did you say? I, I just didn't hear. I just said welcome, everybody, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Right, right, but right before that, you said something else. I don't think so. Okay. I, I wasn't paying attention, I will admit. <laughs> uh, but... That still makes me Rish Outfield and the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And we're back from our lengthy hiatus. No, we're not. This episode is after the episode we're back from our lengthy hiatus on. But we're still back. <laughs> okay, I guess that's true. Ishi, ishi Mashi 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 Monsters. Mashi Monsters, yes. Yeah. My favorite. So this is a companion piece with the episode we did last. Correct? That's right. Sort of. I mean, it's not really a companion piece because... It's not like we wrote them like we do sometimes with our broken mirror things where we actually say, okay, we're writing a story about this, go. Well, I guess we've never shared that with anyone. I was going to say this is more like our stories, but they are on, are they on Amazon? Is that where they are? Is that uh, story about the girl who goes from being a plain Jane type of a girl to suddenly being a beautiful girl. We, We both wrote a story along those lines. And that was kind of like this, where we did it by accident. We weren't meaning to write similar stories. We just both thought, hey, that's a good idea, and we went with it. These stories are more like that, where we both wrote stories about ideas, but not together or as as an exercise or for any purpose like that. It just so happens that they are similar. And so we thought, hey, let's run them together. Perfect. Yeah, whose idea was that? I'm, this, I, I was taking a dump uh-huh. the other day, and it just came to me. That's not funny, man. Only rude people take dumps. Oh, I guess that's true. So uh, have we said what the story is called? and who? We haven't it? yet, but the story is called House of Ideas. And it's by Richard... Out to field. I don't like it when people call me Richard. Oh, sorry. It's by Rish Shalou. Benjamin Outfield, thank you. <laughs> it's by Rish Outfield. The man sitting across the desk from me here is the writer of this story. And he's squirming already a little bit uncomfortably. Little bit. But hey, you had your time in the, in in the was... hot lamp, in the heat <laughs> lamp, in the hot seat. That's what it was. There was a hot lamp, too. It was pretty miserable. Really, it was very sweaty. Touching it against the back of your neck. Yeah, that was... Who's doing that? It was burning. It was funny. But you had your chance to squirm, and so now it's my turnabout. It is fair play. That's right. And the the spirits are also (laughs) wanting their say. But uh, who produced this episode for us? Today's episode was produced by a a veteran of this show, Tyler Privet. Oh, Tyler Privet. Ah, yeah, he did. Um, I'm trying to remember what episode. The Backside of Eternity. That was him. Right, right, right. right. Did he do Erstwhile Mage or was that? Uh... No, you know, yeah, that was him. He did okay. do that. And, uh, and what, what else did he, he do? He also did Child of Darkness, Child of Light. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, The Clappening. Parsec nominated The Clappening. <laughs> Oh, and that one, uh, that kind of odd for our show because it was really artsy, but we did do that one that he did, uh, Night Fell Like Acid Rain in a Post-Apocalyptic Environment. I don't remember that one. I mean, that's nothing to say that Tyler didn't do a great job, but... It was kind of weird because there was no rain in the entire story because the post-apocalyptic... It was all in a desert and I don't, you don't remember the desert? Was it the Nevada desert? Yes, in the middle, the of, middle it? of it. Okay, so I do remember that one. Yeah, yeah. we've, <laughs> Yeah, Tyler Privet doing his first show ever for us here on the Dune Steve. He's a new producer that we've got. He volunteered and was excited. And uh, without further ado, 
Rish Outfield's House of Ideas. Enjoy the story, folks. House of Ideas by Rish Outfield. But more than anything, right now, Gerald had to move his bowels. He was in Barnes & Noble Bookstore, on the corner of Wilshire and the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica. He had been looking in the literary instruction section, hoping for a book he found both inspiring toward his dreams of being a writer and affordable. But like I said, he really had to take a dump. He couldn't hold it much longer and headed immediately toward the escalator. He went upstairs looking for the bathroom on the third floor. It was small, in a little alcove. He stepped inside and found two urinals and a single stall. Someone was in that stall. He waited for a minute, felt stupid standing there as a guy came in to use the urinals, then washed his hands for want of something better to do. He saw himself in the mirror, which was always a bad move, and walked out of the bathroom. He headed to the down escalator, but didn't make it before he felt an almost painful cramping in his stomach. His bowels had spoken. It was now or... now. He turned around and went back into the bathroom. Still, the stall was occupied. Finally, unable to think of what else to do except go next door to the women's restroom, he knocked quickly on the stall door. One minute, a man said within the stall. Gerald heard a rustling of papers. Not toilet papers, though. The other kind. A moment after that, the toilet flushed. As the stall door opened, Gerald felt a bit embarrassed. But, hey, what could he do? I'm sorry, I just really need... He started to say, then cut himself off. Coming out of that stall was Rex Stevens. The Rex Stevens. Gerald's writer hero. This was the guy who wrote Killing Me Not So Softly and Windows to the Soul and Very Small Comfort, not to mention the popular short stories and movie scripts. Stephen started to apologize himself, but Gerald interrupted him. Sorry. Wow, Mr. Stevens, I'm a big admirer of your work. Layers of the Onion was the best story I've ever read. The man was also embarrassed, but smiled. Thanks. Sorry about the wait. He moved past him, and Gerald noticed he had a mead notebook tucked under his arm. No problem, Gerald said, but his butt was telling a different story. I... I gotta go. Me too, Stephen said with another smile, then tapped his temple with a pen. He didn't wash his hands and was gone. Gerald entered the stall and closed it behind him. Was Rex Stevens writing something in here? That was odd. Relief came quickly for Gerald Kapler. He was a young man, just barely out of college at 23, English major, visual arts minor, and he was an earnest and clever small-town boy, prone to flights of fancy and not easily discouraged. All good things for an aspiring storyteller. For years, he had wanted to be a writer, even before he discovered Rex Stevens and his contemporaries. He had won half a dozen creative writing contests in high school and college, but had not thus far been published, unless high school and college publications counted. After college, and saving up cash working in his uncle's petroleum jelly manufacturing plant, he had been ready to move out to the coast to seek his fortune. The California coast was closer than the New York one, so that's the one he'd chosen. And then, nothing happened. He'd been excited and industrious when he first arrived, sending out submissions and cover letters and synopses and resumes. But after a while, the money started to dwindle, and so did his ambition. Gerald was turning all this over in his mind as he sat there in the public facility, when all at once, his mind began to wander. Suddenly, almost like a hallucination, he saw an image in his brain. An image of a young man, his age, a little darker, a little stronger, with a stone. Was it a stone? No, it was an egg of some sort. 
one of those cutesy Fabergé eggs. The pieces started coming together for him. It was a story, a time travel story. What if someone could go back in time as far as they wanted to go, but when they returned, they would have aged as much as how far they went back? It could be interesting. A young man who uses a mystical egg to go back in time to save his father at the cost of his own youth. Hmm. That would be an interesting tale with symbolism of why one can't dwell in the past or be obsessed with past failures while the here and now is here and now. Jared flushed the toilet. He stood up. By the time he had flushed a second time, he had the whole thing written out in his head even the name of his main character. In the end, after constantly traveling back through time, he encounters a younger version of himself who grabs the Fabergé egg from him and smashes it on the sidewalk. Now, says the young version, live your life while you still have a few years left. Gerald left the bathroom. He headed straight down the escalator and left the store, not bothering to pick up the book he had been looking for. He found his little white car, though he looked on the wrong level of the parking garage for five minutes and drove back to his apartment, beginning to write immediately. That was Sunday. By Tuesday, he had written quite a nice short story. Better than nice. In his high school days, Gerald had kept a diligent journal. He started a new one that week, writing, On Sunday, I met my idol, Rex Stevens. That same day, I write the best story ever. Fate. I'm going to remember this day. A year had passed, and things were going much better for Gerald. He was out of his squalid half-bedroom apartment. He had finally fixed the air conditioner in his car and hadn't missed a single meal, unless he wanted to. He had been dating a wafer-thin delivery girl from down the block on and off for the last two months. He had a part-time job as the greeter at Las Romeras, a fresh Mexican food place. But that wasn't why his year was better and his condition sunnier. He had sold his story embryo of the past to a national science fiction magazine who gobbled it up. Though it didn't get a cover mention, it was printed and well received. Soon after, the magazine also bought one of his older tales, Death Marked, about a fugitive whose family and friends are racing to be the first to kill him. Harvey Mathiason, editor of the magazine, had called the other day, telling him that a big piece they had been planning to run in their upcoming anniversary issue had fallen through. The author had given it to Locus or something, and they wanted Gerald to contribute something to take its place. This was, of course, great news, except for the small detail that Gerald had nothing to contribute. He gave it much thought, but nothing was coming. He read a couple of short stories, but no inspiration came. He went for a jog through the park, but no ideas showed up. He even sat on the beach as the sun went down, but his mind was as empty as ever. Walking back, he saw the Third Street promenade up ahead and thought back to his moment of fate more than a year previous. It was a whim, really, that led him into the Barnes & Noble on Wilshire and Third. He looked at the magazine rack. Unfortunately, they didn't have a copy of what he now considered his magazine looked at the upcoming appearances schedule. Dennis Miller was coming to sign his newly published memoirs, then went upstairs to wander around the fiction and literature section. Rex Stevens had just put out a collection where he retold the plots of two of his earlier novels, this time from the villain's point of view. After that, he returned to the literary instruction section, but lightning did not strike again. He was headed for the down escalator when he saw the little restroom sign with the arrow pointing up. Well, he had drunk a 32-ounce Mountain Dew while watching the sunset. Peeing might be a good idea. Standing at one of the urinals, he heard a cough from within the lone bathroom stall. (coughs) Someone was in there. He wondered if... No, it couldn't be. That was stupid. Instead, he focused his eyes on peeing and his mind on ideas. Ideas... Ideas, ideas. No good ones came. Maybe a werewolf story? Where it was a little boy who was the werewolf? Set in the Depression? 
No, not science fiction-y enough. Something better tailored for his magazine. A futuristic story of some sort. Hmm. There was another shuffle from within the stall. Gerald zipped up, and again wondered if Stevens might be in there. It was ludicrous, especially since Rex Stevens lived in Seattle. But he had found him in there once. Toilet flushed. Gerald moved to wash his hands, but did it slowly, curious as to who might be in the stall. When the door finally opened, it was an old man who shuffled distantly to the sink. Gerald stepped out of his way and caught the old man's eye in the mirror. There was a bright gleam there, as if he were particularly happy. Maybe a story about an old man who goes insane. Maybe he kills his family, only to find out that they aren't his family at all. No, that's pretty much how Death Marked turned out. Damn it. Gerald left the bathroom and walked across the third floor, glancing cursorily at the poetry and history sections. He got to the escalator, a little disappointed in the experience, but much more disappointed that he had expected another brush with destiny in a public restroom. Once he reached the second floor, he walked around to get to the escalator to reach the first floor. The setup of this B&N had always bothered him, as if it were designed by Escher or a like mind. Halfway to the bottom floor, a little voice in his head, usually his idea voice, said three words. Try the stall. It felt like something you'd see in a sitcom. But Gerald went all the way around to the other side of the room, rode the escalator up to the second floor, walked around to the next escalator, rode it up to the third floor, and walked into the restroom. It was stupid, yes, but Gerald had been stupid before. One time, he canceled the flight because he didn't like the flight number. And one time, he had pulled his car over to the side of the road on the way home, turned off the engine, counted to ten, and started back on his way. He didn't know why, but these were things he had done. And he supposed there would be one or two more stupid, irrational acts in his future somewhere. There was no one in the stall. There was a black man dressed in a suit and tie coming out of the bathroom before he got there. It didn't seem to matter, but as a writer, Gerald often noticed unnecessary details, like the fact that the man had a lapel pin of Pinocchio on his tie. Gerald entered the stall, stepped up to the toilet, then walked in a little circle. He grabbed a wad of tissue in case someone might be watching under the door and tried to blow his nose into it. He threw the tissue into the bowl flushed it, and suddenly thought about suicide. Not for him, but for colonists. New Earth colony colonists, cut off from the outside world for the next few months. These people were killing themselves, one at a time, calmly, in orderly but dissimilar manners. It was up to a new colonist to get to the bottom of it before it was his turn to go. There was no doubt about it. It was the stall. All during the writing of the human lemmings, Gerald postulated other reasons, other explanations, other origins of his idea. But he always ended on the stall. Even if it was illogical, even if it was crazy, what else could it be? Harvey really liked the story, and why not? It was clever enough to make readers think, and low-tech enough to appeal to the dimmest sci-fi fanatic. And it was fun to read, something that took talent. So Gerald P. Kapler, the P sounded better for a published writer, had found his muse. And if it happened to be made of porcelain, no one was the wiser. Summer gave up the dance floor to fall, and Gerald had a deal to write his first novel. It was no big deal, really. Just all his wildest dreams come true. It involved a bit of pressure and a good deal of wild brain activity. Gerald had written a full-length novel between his senior year of high school and sophomore year of college, but it had been juvenile, disjointed, sprawling, and exhausting. Though he'd thought he was on to something at the time, he knew now it was not worth rewriting. So it had to be something from scratch. Of course, The first thing he did, after his meeting with his agent, before he even called his folks, was head for the bookstore. 
parking was infuriatingly slow and difficult. He should have had his car valet parked, he realized, too late. After all, he should get used to being able to afford it. And when he finally got inside Barnes & Noble, he practically leapt up the escalator stairs. Excuse me? He glanced up to see a woman in her mid-thirties, with over-permed hair and little pink bruises on her nose where she normally wore glasses, but didn't today. He didn't know her. Me? Gerald asked. At this point in his career, he didn't even consider she might be a fan. Are, are you headed for the restroom? She asked hesitantly. It was a rather bizarre question, especially since he had just stepped onto the third floor. Still, maybe there was something wrong. Maybe the secret was out. Yes, he responded, just as hesitantly. Could you check and see if my husband is in there? She asked. I was supposed to meet him downstairs ten minutes ago. Sure, Gerald said, passing her by. His name is Sean? She added. I'll check, he said, and stepped into the tiny room. There were at least five men waiting for use of the stall. What the hell? Gerald almost didn't believe it. He stepped to the end of the line and observed his company and situation. Both urinals stood unoccupied. The stall door was closed. All five, six now, people, stood semi-patiently against the bathroom wall. Two of them were quietly chatting. One read a newspaper. One seemed to be dancing. An up-and-coming Hollywood screenwriter who had made it big adapting one of James Elroy's novels was standing at the head of the line. He mumbled a profanity, then kicked the stall door. Damn son of a bitch. Hey! This isn't a timeshare, you know. A moment later, a young man came out, a laptop computer in his hand. He made no apologies and headed out the door. As soon as he left, Gerald asked the intellectual-looking Asian man in front of him what was going on. The Asian guy gave him a look over his newspaper that could only be described as unfriendly. What do you think? Well, isn't there another restroom you can use? You are welcome to look for one, asshole, said the Asian guy. Gerald shut up. It was the first rude Asian person he had met, thus breaking the stereotype forever. The man who was now first in line turned out to be Sean, whose wife was looking for him. He stepped out for less than a minute to talk to her, and the man behind him wouldn't let him back in line. When he protested, both the Asian guy and the new front man threatened him physically. Finally, Sean simply trudged out of the restroom, broken-hearted. Gerald wanted to apologize, but couldn't bring himself to say anything. Eventually, the line moved up. By the time it was Gerald's turn to go inside, there were already two people behind him in line. A businessman stepped into the bathroom and stopped when he saw the line. Gerald thought the guy looked like a very young Hitler, complete with a chaplain mustache, only taller and thinner and blonder. The man shook his head and retreated back out the door. When Gerald got inside the stall, the welcome flow of ideas began almost immediately. It was like dreaming, in a way, and he wondered if these images were coming from his own subconscious or from another, more mysterious source. The first thing that came into his head was, that businessman you saw while you were in line. What if he didn't just look like Hitler? What if he was Hitler? But unlike the writing exercise question it sounded like, a good answer came instantly back, followed by more questions and more answers. When he opened the stall door and walked past the three men standing there, his mind was so filled with thoughts for his novel, he wished he had brought a tape recorder with him. It's not as if the novel wrote itself. Jared still had to sit at the notebook, and then the computer, and sort out his ideas. He still had to work on the characters and make conscious choices about the turns the story would take. He still had to come up with dialogue, setting, descriptions, metaphors, titles, names, and make-up details. He still made mistakes, and crossed things out, and changed his mind, and changed it back. In other words, he still had to write the book himself, even if inspired by something else. And it was hard at times. For example, Gerald knew how he wanted the story to end, 
with hope that the human race would put itself back together eventually. And he knew who he wanted to survive. Captain Cass and his family, Angela, Dr. Milsey, Jackie, and at least one of Admiral Vaughn's children. But he didn't know specifics, and he certainly didn't know how the good guys were going to overcome Vaughn's seemingly innumerable armada. This had to be a great novel, and completely satisfy him, since it could be the only one he'd ever publish. It was no surprise to him that he went back to the Third Street Promenade. He had stilted his visits up to this point. One trip seemed to give him a few months' worth of ideas to work with. He parked his car on the street this time, still a full two blocks from the promenade, damn the traffic, and walked briskly toward the corner. He was accosted no less than three times by panhandlers and told himself he'd help them out on the day he finished his book. As he got on the escalator, he felt a sudden excitement in his stomach as if he were going to meet the girl of his dreams. It built as he crossed to the second escalator, and by the time he got to the third floor, his heart was beating hard, and his legs wanted to run. If someone had seen him, they would have assumed his need for the restroom was quite immediate, and they would have been sure they were right when they saw his expression upon reading the restroom closed sign on the men's room door. He couldn't believe it. He looked around. Not far off, there was an employee in fiction and literature, turning books so they faced outward instead of on their side. Gerald approached him, a twenty-something with a poorly grown goatee and three piercings in his face. Excuse me, how long is the restroom closed? The employee stepped away from the row of Atlas Shrugged and sighed theatrically. Gerald caught sight of another piercing in his tongue. I don't know. Stop asking me. Gerald had never met the man before. Well, is there another restroom? Well, there's the women's, the employee said, thinking it was pretty funny. Gerald frowned and returned to the restroom door. He tried it anyway, found it locked, and actually put his hands on the door for a moment, hoping to absorb ideas through the force or osmosis. No one saw him doing this, but he wouldn't have cared if they had. Nevertheless, it hadn't worked. Back on the first floor, Gerald saw the manager, a tall man in his early 30s, dressed entirely in brown, including his shoes, filling out an order form of some kind at the desk. Excuse me, are you the manager? Yes, yes I am, said the man. Right before he did, Gerald saw him steel himself as if he were used to a violent barrage of complaints every time he answered that question. May I help you? Gerald smiled innocently. This was a look reserved only for his mother and, recently, his agent. Can I have the key to the restroom, please? I'm sorry. The restroom is out of order. The man had probably said that already today. For how long? The manager's focus shifted slightly. We're retiling. Gerald wondered if he might be a religious man. He was lying. Oh. Almost casually, Gerald added, Does the toilet still work? Uh, Yes. Yes, it does. I'll give you $20 to let me use it. He reached for his wallet to prove his sincerity. A scowl crossed the manager's face. He wiped it away, though, as he had most certainly been trained to do. Look, you can use the restroom right down the street. Gerald decided to take it further. He leaned forward, man to man. You're not really retiling, are you? The manager studied him quickly, then decided to level with him. No. Some guy spent the night hiding in the stall. We thought he was homeless, but it turned out he worked for Sony. He put enough emphasis on the last word to eliminate any doubt as to what he thought of that. Gerald shrugged. It's a weird world we live in, huh? Then he flashed that agent mother smile again. So, can we deal? Do you really have to use the restroom? Make me stand here a little longer and find out. Gerald shifted his weight from one foot to the other, something he realized he should have been doing all along. It didn't matter, though, for the manager nodded, stepped away from his desk, and headed toward the escalator. 
Okay. Fishing his keys from his pocket. Gerald had checked on the ride up. The man's socks were brown, too. He stood at the restroom door and didn't notice Gerald's attempts to keep himself calm or his eyes covetously ogling the restroom key. The door was unlocked and opened, and the light was switched on. Gerald moved past the manager, thanking him, then disappeared into the stall. The manager stood by the sink, checking himself in the mirror. He started to straighten his tie when he heard Gerald shout, The molester! He gasped and crossed quickly to the stall. What? Gerald came out of the stall, a huge grin on his face. The child molester saves the world! The manager could not have looked at him more disgustedly. Get out! He said through clenched teeth. The novel turned out well. Gerald's rewriting process was quick and painless, and the editors had almost nothing to say. The cover art was really amazing. Also, due to how well-received the ARCs had been, the publisher decided to double the number of copies printed. Nebula-nominated author Gerald P. Kapler was doing just fine. He no longer worked in the Mexican restaurant, not even for fun had his own little house, and he usually let others park his car for him. That car wasn't the old white Miata that left oil stains like a dog marking his territory either, but a sweet little thing with power everything and a tank that never ran low. He had traded in his old girlfriend for a newer model as well, although this one was a little harder to get in gear. He wrote and read every day and got more sleep than he knew was good for him. He got several pieces of fan mail a week and had drafted a form letter he had an assistant mail out for him. His refrigerator was kept as fully stocked as his printer. Things were very, very good. But one day, while reading through his notes and the work he had done the day before, Gerald didn't like what he saw. It was bland. It didn't inspire. It wasn't enjoyable to read or to write. It was derivative, or even more so than his work usually was. And it wasn't magical. That was the missing piece. Barnes & Noble was the same as ever. Same feel, same crowd of people at the magazine stand near the door, same smell from the coffee counter, same weird setup with the escalators. Everything was the same, but not the third-floor restroom. It was gone. Both the men's and women's restrooms had been walled up with an upcoming events display and an unmarked, locked door in their place. Gerald rode the escalator down to the first floor, following a sign that said restrooms. The new ones were even tinier than before, jammed into where the books-on-tape section used to be. He stepped into the men's room and closed the door behind him felt nothing. He went into the stall and stood there, holding his breath, letting his mind go free. But nothing came. His mind was empty. No concepts, no settings, no characters, no morals, no plots, not even a joke. He let his breath out. (sighs) He spat into the toilet and walked out of the stall. Then, He turned around and went back into the stall and flushed the toilet. He went to the sink and turned the water on. It took a second before any came out. He splashed some on his face. Gerald trudged out of the new restroom and got on the up escalator, trying to fight off despair. He had to talk to an understanding employee. He found one on the second floor at a desk near the music books. She was an amazingly fat woman around 30 years old though it was hard to tell exactly. Excuse me, he began. The restroom that was upstairs... The restrooms are now on the first floor, sir, she said, not even making cursory eye contact, but beginning to pick at a sale sticker on a book cover. It was angering for some reason, as if he had a deformity she was trying not to look at. Thank you, I know, he said, trying to hide his annoyance. But the restroom that used to be upstairs, where the wall is now? She didn't look up from the book. 
It's now on the first floor, sir, said the woman, putting undue emphasis on sir. Gerald actually grabbed her arm. Ma'am, he said sharply, and only then did she look at him. She had deep blue eyes, almost pretty in spite of her face. Please, why did they close up that restroom? Are you the guy that left his cell phone in there? He let go of her arm then, resuming a casual position. No. She glanced down at the book in her hand, then shrugged. Well, there were, I don't know, incidents in that restroom that made us relocate them. Just in the men's restroom? Of course. She said, as if that went without saying. Listen, I don't know if you're one of them or not, but there were drugs being dealt in there, among other things. Drugs? He repeated, knowing that could not be, but wondering if she really believed it. Those tropical-looking eyes narrowed in disgust. You are one of them. No, I just... Sir, I'm very busy, the woman said, though there was no one around the desk and an open magazine sat in front of her. Was it really drugs? Gerald asked, trying hard to put all his concern and innocence and credibility into his gaze. She looked at him for a full second, clearly all the time she was willing to spend. Finally, she whispered, A man was killed in there. That was completely unexpected. Really? A young guy, like you. More muscular, though. As if she was one to talk. You saw him? Only for a second. He was stabbed. She looked around to make sure they weren't being spied on. Stabbed with a pen. Why? He thought about it. About what would drive someone to kill in a public restroom. And if it might have something to do with its special properties. I don't know. They never caught the guy. She said. We closed it up. People still want to go in there, though. She grabbed her magazine and began to walk briskly away. And people keep on asking. Gerald followed, quickly catching up to her. Wait, wait a minute. What's there now? A wall. No, there was a door. She stopped. You're as bad as the last guy. Thought he was some kind of big shot, too. I don't think I'm... He smiled one last time. No guile here. He was beginning to get sick of that smile. Like an actor stuck in the same role. Please. She sighed. It's an employee restroom now. Gerald thought fast. But not fast enough. Employee. The woman repeated. If you need a place to piss, it's on the first floor. Gerald let her go. Thanks, he said, but not quite loud enough for her to hear. She didn't stop walking, either. Gerald let the escalator take him down toward the exit. That was it. Nothing. The end of his career. But then, an idea came. A small, stupid one. At the customer service desk, a young black man was ringing up a Harry Potter book. He made a friendly comment to the customer and then turned to Gerald. Can I help you? The man looked slightly familiar to Gerald, but he couldn't quite place him. Until he saw a Pinocchio pin on the employee's lapel. Gerald smiled big. This one came a little easier. Could I get an application, please? He asked. Get a paper bag, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so that was our story. After the story, the clapping. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a cast list for this story, which is probably not unusual. I think we always do cast lists now, isn't it? It's been so long since we've done an episode that I it's have true. forgotten. I feel confused and 
frightened by your world. So the story was narrated by myself, Rex Stevens, and Gerald P. Kapler. What did the P stand for? Just P. Like P E E? Oh, uh-huh. that's horrible. Yeah, it's like, you know, J when somebody's name is middle name is J and it's J A Y. Same kind of a thing. Nebula nominated Gerald P. Kapler was played by Rich Outfield. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sean's wife, who was. We never really met Sean, but we did meet his wife. She was the one looking for her husband outside the restroom. Uh, was played by Lindsay Privet. Huh. You're going to hear that name a lot, by the way, because. The twenty-something pierced employee was played by Tyler Privet, our producer extraordinaire. The manager of the Barnes and Noble was played by Blaine Privet. Wow. Okay. The obese lady who wouldn't look in Gerald P. Kapler, Nebula-nominated author's face, was played by t- <laughs> was played by Tiffany Privet, the angry Asian who forever broke the stereotype, was played by Tin Duong. Privet. No, no Privet for once. You know, it breaks my heart that he got an actual Asian to do that. (laughs) And the young black clerk was played by Freddie Granado. Um, Also, Tyler wanted to say thanks to Clay... Ooh, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this guy's name right, but Clay Boytnot, I'm going to say... Waste not, boint not. That's right. Because that guy helped him out a lot. He co-produced over his shoulder, and he says he saved him hours of trouble. He was a damn good mentor for audio production of any kind. And they're even thinking about branching out and doing their own podcast together, which they've probably got 15 episodes of by now, considering our general pace. We are and just trying. I mean, how long has it been since uh, uh, Idea City? One hour. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, what he really said about working on the story, I'll, I'll let you say it. It has been fun and... Yeah. This has been fun. A shitload of work. It's not worth every minute. Oh, okay. There's a silver lining there. Yes. Shitload in all caps. <laughs> yeah, folks, if you would also like to experience a shitload of work, <laughs> we're always allowing people to produce for us and take our stories in the direction they want to go. It, it is fun to hear how people interpret things. Like, there were actually a couple of moments where, you know, he interpreted the text in a different way than I would have expected. And, and that's always, you know, a surprise or, you know, when. You you hear it in your head or see it in your head. I don't know how you write. Then I hear somebody say something in a different way or put an emphasis on a different word. And it, it sort of has a life of its own. It's like, oh, OK. Well, yeah, that, you know what? That's a valid interpretation of that line. I always meant for it to mean this. And yeah, there was a toilet flush or several in there, I think. Yeah, that's surprising. You don't have a lot of stories with toilet flushes in them. I do. <laughs> It's funny, we could have put these two stories on here and and not included the who wrote the story part, you know, leave the byline off, and then said, guess which one is the Rish Outfield story? And you know, the second that it starts out with, but what he really had to do was take a dump. Did it start with a dump or or move his bowels or what was the line? I don't remember. I think take a dump was the first one. Yeah. Um, As soon as that first line, oh, this one's the Rish story. Okay. Well, I, and this isn't an interesting story, but I'm going to tell it as though it is. Okay, okay. I'll try and um, act interested in it. This story sort of came about when I first moved to Los Angeles. We were doing a writer's group. Yeah? And our... Don't, don't do that. <laughs> and I'm our, sorry. I'm trying to make it work here. Our uh, mutual ex-friend, Brandon, uh, he was, sort, was one of the hosts of the writer's group. We would meet at his house like every other time or every third time kind of thing. But he just enjoyed challenging people to do stuff and he said you know I he said to me I challenge you to write a story where the first line is he really had to take a dump and and you're like I've already got five of those stories what are you talking <laughs> I'm like, about done it's in my hand <laughs> here let me just there that's the first line of you, the story do you want a long version of that story <laughs> or I've got two that have that exact same thing so it was a sort of a challenge of okay write a story based upon this first line he really had to take a dump I think that's what the line was but 
you took umbrage with the butt. Yes. I don't like uh, the fact that it starts with a butt because that means that there should be something before that we're missing. Because butt is the second half of a sentence. You say blah, 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 but he really had to do was take it down. See, I, I like that. I like that. I, I'm, I'm fairly sure I threw in the butt rather than following Brandon's exact quote of because you, know, you are a butt. Because it does feel like it's in the middle of the action or something like that. Or, oh, it's or in, maybe, in medias res? Is that what you're saying? Ooh, I would never have been that hoity-toity, but it's, it's sort of drawing attention to the absurdity of the first line. I, I, have you never done a story where I've challenged you to write the first sentence or anything like that? It's cause, I don't think so. I don't think I've done a first sentence. We used to challenge, challenge each other with things back and forth all the time. Yeah, usually it's always just a, here's the idea, go, kind of a thing, not a, here's the first, although we did do a, here's three words that must be in your story, go. Maybe that can be our next uh, triple word score. Instead of three words, it's, this is the first line, go. I love doing stuff like that because it forces you to think up things that you wouldn't think of on your own. And how do you make up a story about a guy who really needed to dump it out <laughs> on it through the water? Who really needed to take a dump? Uh, and, and it sort of sets up the tone of the story, too, with that vulgar of, or that absurd a first line. But anyhow, uh, so I wrote this story, I'd say 2001 or 2002. And in listening to it, I was brought back to a lot of the things that were going on in my life at that time. And that Barnes & Noble, that was like a really important place to me when I first moved to, to L.A. Because I had no money at all. But I could go to that Barnes & Noble for three hours. That's how much free parking. That's, you could park for three hours for free. And I could just sit there with a book and read for three hours. And it cost me nothing. And, it, you know, who knows if that Barnes & Noble is still there. Because yeah, it's likely that's that it's prime not. real estate and bookstores just aren't what they were. In fact, this story is on the edge of obsolescence already, I think, because of just the publishing world and, and books and the, his publisher was going to order extra books because of ARCs and stuff. When I wrote it, there were no podcasts. There were no, you know, people just publishing things on the Internet. Or if there were, you know, it wasn't a big enough deal that you could make money off of that or... And so it's sort of just a uh, a piece of, or it's a, a thing of from its time. A lot of the th it's a mirror of its time. Ew, I don't uh, that was that a class? Yeah, we had to take that class at, in film school. Film is a mirror of its time. Okay, and yeah, that's what it would be. It feels to me like that time period. I remember every time I went to the Third Street Promenade, panhandlers would try and get you to give them money and in fact i think that was the last time i ever gave money to a homeless person because he insulted i've told you this story before after i gave him money he he insulted me to my face and i was just like i was so hurt by that that i and maybe i should cut this out because it makes me sound like a douche but i was just like oh I, i'll never do this again ever why you ruined it for everybody you broke the stereotype <laughs> like the rude asian guy in the line it was a it was a slap in the face, essentially. Um, but anyhow, I was just listening to that and remembering what it was like when I first lived there and having no money, like poor Gerald had no money at the very beginning. And uh, now I'm away from L.A. and I'm away from that. I may never go to that Barnes & Noble again. And that terrible way of getting up to the third floor to go to the bathroom. When I would share this story with the writers group, you know, I think it was like in two installments, I... I wrote it. They all nodded and knew exactly what I was talking about because it was so badly organized that Barnes & Noble, you had to go around the building to get to the next level and around instead of just having the escalators right next to each other where they were supposed to be. So that was purposefully organized to make you walk past all the books while you pee. And then you're like, oh, wait, here's a book I'd like. You know, you, you may have a point there, but... It's like how when you go to the grocery store and... The things that people buy the most are like milk and bread and eggs or something like that. Are at the very And bad. they put them all the way back in the corners so that you have to go through everything. 
to get to them. You have to walk down the cereal aisle and go, ooh, oh, Fruity Pebbles. I, I haven't had those in a while. I need to get a box. And oh, look, Pop-Tarts too. By the time you get finally back to the corner to get the milk, the, your one gallon of milk you came in to get, you've got a whole cart full of groceries. Okay, well then that's an explanation. I've, it's been a dozen years, and now I finally know why it was set up that way. It's too late now because the place is gone. I wonder if anybody that is listening uh, lives nearby, and hopefully if they do, they can give us a status update of the Barnes & Nobles. Is it still around? Does it still have the same weird style of escalators? Uh, you see, I bet in this day and age, there's a device you can just type into, and people will know whether it exists or not. You, you think so? have to go there. A device? Like a, like a magic kind of box that you just write something into, and it tells you if something exists? Okay, when you put it that way, it does sound a little too unbelievable. I mean, a toilet stall that inspires creativity, that I can buy. But a magic box that answers all your questions. No. Yeah, that's a little much. Okay, Maybe you... if you just held the bu- a button down and then said Barnes & Noble, Santa Monica into it. and into That I could believe. But a box that you write into? That's crazy. Wait, there's a thing you can talk into <laughs> and it will tell you whether it exists or not? That's cool. We should ask them to be our sponsor again. Yeah, we should. That would be fun. Remind me, now I shouldn't be talking because, you know, this is my story and you should be asking questions and commenting Uh what you uh thought about it. I mean, I know already what I think of this story. When did you first read this story or hear this story? You sent it to me, I think, not too long after you wrote it, I would say, probably 2003 or four or something. I think I was still in California, too, when you sent it to me and I read it and I thought, oh, I think I may have read it while sitting on the toilet. (laughs) To tell you the truth, I've done a lot of reading things while sitting on the toilet, so it's not that big of a crazy thing to say, but I almost feel like I have a memory of sitting on the toilet, taking a dump, and reading this story. So, there's that. But yeah, yeah, I remember reading that and just thinking, oh, this is a great story, this is really enjoyable. And I must have tried to push you to do something with it, I don't know what I could have pushed you to do, maybe send it into a magazine back when magazines still existed. I remember trying to encourage you and saying, you should write more, too. You should write a sequel to this called The Fall of the House of Ideas. Oh, hey, that's not bad. (laughs) Um, The ideas that you mentioned in the story, are any of them anything but silliness? I don't think any of... Unlike your story the last time, I'm not actually referencing stories that I've written Sometimes it's fun just to come up with a premise for a story that you're never going to write. Uh-huh. Like the human lemmings one in there, of just a whole bunch of, se- of not settlers, what do you call them? Colonists. Colonists. They just start killing themselves. And it seems like that would be a really fun sci-fi story where you're the secretary of, of colonization or something like that, right? And you keep getting these reports. And you're just like 112 colonists on Altair 4 dead. That's a third of them. How is this? Is it, okay, four or more just this week. We got to get to the bottom of this. Why would they be killing themselves? And maybe that kind of story has been written a lot. I don't know. It was just a premise that appealed to me and it was fun. And, and you uh-huh. know, all of these seemed like premises that could make fun stories, but I've never written any of the stories now. Is it really premises? Is that really the, the plural? I don't. No, I I like saying that because it's again hoity toity. Hoity toity. You you scoffed when I said, "What did I say?" Anyways, I've forgotten it now. Oh, in medias res. Oh, uh, yeah. And now here you are saying premises as though that's okay. Get out, sir. I apparently I have become what I most despise. Well, there you go. That doesn't happen very often to you. Doesn't wait. Doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> The, there's also that line in there where you say the child molester saved the world. Is that, I've I always, I don't know if this started when you wrote the story or after, but somehow I swear we've said that line a hundred times. I wonder we may have even said it before on the show. Really? I wouldn't be surprised if I listened to all the episodes and went, oh, there it is. Oh, don't do that. I'm not going to. Don't worry. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to an episode of our show. Okay. 
But yeah, did that start from that story or is that No, something? no, that was in school. Do you remember when you and I first met our buddy Ian? He had this idea of, uh, of breeding pine trees. <laughs> no, he had this idea of us having like a, a, a film, a group of film students, almost like a... a a Soviet collective, if okay, you will, okay, where everyone would be equal, and we would all come together, and we would share our ideas, and whichever idea we felt had the most merit, we would make a film of that, and then it would be the next person. Wow, we would all have rotating positions. You know what I mean? This I mean, sounds it was all, really dreamlike. Well, yeah, it was. We would like uh, link arms at the elbow and walk arm in arm together, right down the street, and one person would have a guitar and play like a nice folk song. Yes, he, he conceived of a place where we all were brothers. and uh, No it, heaven up above us, no hell down below. Imagine. It's easy if you try, John. <laughs> but it, 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 it was untenable in real life because somebody who had directed once didn't want to suddenly become the gaffer the next time. It's just like, oh, no, I'm the director because God put me there. <laughs> but... What it wound up doing instead was turning us all into enemies. Well, you did. Bitter, bitter enemies. Well, I don't know about the bitter. I think the money turned us into bitter enemies. But the first part, the competition is what kind of separated everything. But the very, very first time that we got together, we all got in a room together. And and maybe let me rephrase the first time that I was part of this, because you might have had many meetings before I got part of this. But we were all in, in a room together, and he said, hey, we, I, we'd like to make a, a film. We have to make a film or films for our major, for uh, production class. So what we would like is some ideas. And we all just kicked ideas around. And for some reason, I just thought it would be funny uh, to, to say, well, yes, uh, what about a story where a child molester saves the world? And Ian was so offended by that, so upset that I started saying it all the time. Anytime it was just like, well, hey, what are you working on right now? I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm working on a script where a child molester saves the world. And I'm sure that's where that came from. Does, does any of this sound familiar? Do you remember that? Were you in that room that time when it's like, oh, what? everybody give some ideas. Let's throw them out. And I was lucky enough, I guess, to have an idea that they liked, even though it was a joke. I um, was in that room. I don't recall you saying the child molester saves the world, though. I do remember the idea that we did go with. That was sort of a joke, and you were kind of surprised when we went with it. Yeah, and the administration was quite surprised as well. Oh, yes. Administration uh, was surprised with everything that came Anything I with. touched, the administration yes. was just like, wow. Wow, this kid should not only be kicked out of school, he should be killed. <laughs> <laughs> I look back on those times fondly. It just It was a time when... We were trying to be creative and trying to express ourselves and trying to find our own voices. And I think that's what this story is about a little bit, you know, is where does your inspiration come from and what Uh do you do with it? And uh, wouldn't it be great if there was some magical place that you could go and be inspired or have a muse just suddenly start shouting in your ear and you're like, wow, I have to write this down because the muse will not be ignored. The muse is shouting in my ear. If I don't write it down, it won't stop shouting. I'm going to go deaf. You were talking about how you think it's fun to just come up with ideas, Goofy, in like like the guy had, you know, the human lemmings. If I looked well enough, I remember there was a time where you sent me an email. You were trying to encourage me to write, I believe, and you're like, maybe this will encourage you. And you sat down and you just wrote down probably three dozen ideas the majority of them were probably just jokes a lot of them were just super goofy cheesy ideas some of them were good ideas but yeah you you wrote all these down and then sent them off to me here you go email go and how many of them did you write none um but uh they were fun I wonder how long it would take me to unearth that email. I know that I have it somewhere. Multiple Parsec nominee B.D. Anklevich wrote. (laughs) Hey, I'm a Parsec winner now, damn it. You don't say nominee anymore. I know, but to say multiple sounded cool. Oh, yeah, I guess that is better. You could say multiple nominee and winner, although that might Uh, give people the wrong idea. I think there would probably be people out there that say that you're not a winner. 
that Renee is. The yeah, that's probably true. And I would be one of those people. <laughs> Thank you for the you vote are. of confidence. I move for a vote of no confidence. I come here to address this issue before the Senate now. <laughs> so where do you get your ideas from, Mr. Author? You know, someday when you really are an author that people care about, people will ask you that question. What will you say? Well, it would be fun to say that there's a toilet, a special toilet <laughs> stall that I go into whenever style. I run out of ideas and suddenly I have one. Just because it's a, f a funny idea that I think any creative person who's ever struggled with writer's block can or appreciate. Or struggled on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Should we address that as well? How many toilet-centric stories that I've got? Now, do you want to be um, Dr. Freud for a moment? Tell me about your mother. Why, why do you think that I'm uh, <laughs> Sigmund Freud? I, I can't remember the why do you Actually, that's supposed to come after, so I ruined it. I'm supposed to say, why do you say I'm not Sigmund Freud? Although I think you start by saying, why do you say you're Sigmund Freud? Why do you say I'm not Sigmund Freud? Uh, that was a bad uh, sidetrack. Go back to your... Uh, uh, no, I was just asking you why... I have so many, and we'll have to use this word, scatological mm. stories. Where did you first hear that word? Scatological. It's an interesting word. Very hoity-toity. <laughs> I think it might have been in the Institution for the Criminally Insane that I spent some time during. <laughs> and that was part of my prognosis. I think I first heard diagnosis. that when I was reading the... Uh, Submission guidelines for escape pod. They said stories that are scatological oh. need not apply. Did they really say that? Not quite in those words, but they did say the word scatological and and need not. Well, I don't think they said need not. See, that's signs, signs everywhere, signs. Yes, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, that's where I think I first learned that word. I went scatological. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Then I looked it up and I went, oh, I guess I need not apply. What was the podcast <laughs> that we were going to send a story and it said, detailed write-ups of your role-playing game adventures need not be, you know. I can't remember apply. what that one was. But I laughed out loud when we received that because we had had somebody who would submit <laughs> write-ups of, yeah. of what role-playing game he and his friends had played the other day. And I wonder, maybe it was that same guy that inspired their rule. Not to yeah, could be. Yeah, I, I, I am so amused by the scatological. I think most people outgrow that at about seven. 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 <laughs> but. but yeah, we on this show, we did your story, although I think it was an incentive episode. The so many <laughs> So many people may not know the story. That was the crappening. <laughs> You, you miss folk title. Well, I believe the author on that one was B.D. Outfield. <laughs> what was the one where the guy crashed his car? The whole camping trip one. What was that one called? Uncle? No, not say uncle. Uh, it was about his uncle. Home runs. Home runs. A pun. A pun upon your household. <laughs> upon both your households. Yes. A nice punny title, Home Runs, a story of yours that we did on this show that we haven't done your story entitled Space Shit, but I bet someday we will. No, we will not. Oh, we will. We won't. Why would wonder what circumstances would we ever do that story? The circumstances in which we need another episode. <laughs> Next week, folks. <laughs> What other stories? You've got dozens of them. Well, I sent you the awful tale of the Minnesota oh, yes, Diarrhea Ghost go. the other day. That was a story that I wrote in I Am to you, hoping that it would amuse you. It, it did, did not. not. Of course not. But I'm oh not amused gosh, by scatological just, things. I'm so seven years entertained old. by, oh, I'm seven years <laughs> old. Yeah, I'm entertained by that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, maybe we've lost a lot of listeners because of it. <laughs> It's possible, uh, uh, probable. But yeah, the Minnesota Diarrhea Ghost is <laughs> available on Smashwords, right? For free. For free, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, like a I shorty, a super shorty. I could not live with myself charging for that story. <laughs> but yeah, that's definitely a theme. So 
in the future, if you come across a story and, and it's got a scatological bent to it, and it doesn't say Rich Outfield is the author, it's probably just a pseudonym. So I do. Well, do you remember my? I don't know that you ever read it. That I wrote a story called The Brown Prom. You never did we, uh, send it to me. I for asked my you for junior it. prom, we all went to this place to eat, and we all got diarrhea from it. And it hit just like in the middle of the dance part of the prom. And it was just such a bizarre, horrible story. I mean, it actually happened that I had to write a story about it. And so in my story, it was just like this kid somehow out of you know a, a wild series of circumstances gets the girl of his dreams to go to the prom with him and then this diarrhea thing hits and just absolutely ruins the what should be the night of his life why am i talking about oh because it's scatological and yeah if there are people out there that hate that kind of stuff i'm sorry it's it's all in fun yeah it's too bad but you know just just between you and me you do it too <laughs> I know you're offended. It happens. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, wait, is this it? Is this uh, anything more? Because now, do you are, you you put football references in your stories? I don't do that on purpose. That's um, just me. And you have really, really bad things happen to people at the end of the stories. Okay. Is there? And are there any other? Is there a third sign that maybe the story was written by big? Um, you know you're reading a big Anklevich story when... <laughs> uh, I don't know. If it starts off with something like, I don't know if the house was evil or if the evil corrupted the house. <laughs> but it was there. I could Swear see to me. The day that I moved in. That was one thing that I did have a, a, a kind of an issue with or something like that. I remember when I, the one comment, I was in this writer's group that I got on this website where they would just, you'd put your name in a hat, basically, and they would assign you to a group of people. And that would be a writer's group. And you were supposed to write stories and send it off to them. And I did this for a little while. And all the comments were just inane, useless, utterly stupid comments that I got back from my stories. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm not in the right writer's group. And so I kind of bailed on the writer's group. What Can you give me an example of an inane? But when you say inane, you got the impression they hadn't read your story? No. Or just, they were trying to fix things that didn't need fixing? Right. Or they were just dumb people? A little of both of those last two. Ne I never felt like they hadn't read the story. But yeah, they were fix trying to fix things that weren't fi didn't need fixing. And, uh, yeah, sometimes it seemed like they were dumb people. I read some of their, their stories, too, and I'm just like, oh, this is the worst story ever. It's terrible. And then people are like, oh, I loved your story. And this was good about it. And I thought, oh, I think well, I'm not in the right place. Um, this is sort of an extension the, of our conversation from the last <laughs> one. So if you guys listen to this back to back, we've covered the, the subject completely. But when the one comment that I did get out of them that was worthwhile was when somebody said, hey, oh, I see. You start with like a little prologue on every story that you write and then you do the story. Like you start with something like, I don't know if the house was evil or if the evil corrupted the house, but it was there. I first sensed it the day we moved in. <laughs> but yeah, I, I realized that I did. I did that with uh, pretty much every story. I'd start off with some thing. And I thought, huh, maybe I shouldn't do that. I don't even know. To tell you the truth, I don't know. Maybe I'm ruining my stories now that I don't have those awesome opening lines. Oh, Although, but your... Sorry to interrupt. Your natural inclination is to always include those. And you've been squelching that in your recent stories? I don't know. I think I may have just squelched it enough way back when that I don't do it anymore. It's not so much a natural inclination anymore. The, the thing with that evil corrupting the house, house evil, it didn't work at all. After I wrote the story, I was like, oh, yeah, I know why the house was... Yeah, it wasn't that the house was evil or that the evil... I know where the evil came from. I talked about it and went all the way through it by the end of the story. So that first line is stupid. I need to get rid of it. Um, okay, so the person said, I like that you do this with the little prologues, or they were saying, no. oh, I see what you they do. They said, you oh, do I it. recognize a pattern. Your pattern is doing this. And I thought, it is? 
Um, and I was kind of surprised that somebody made an observation in that group that mattered, that that meant something that was real, that I hadn't noticed myself already. I don't know. It was weird. I sound like a pompous ass, don't I? No, I don't think so at all, because okay. you're criticizing your own work here. Okay. And would a pompous ass do that? Well, you criticize your own work a lot. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, I'm not making the connection here. <laughs> does it bother you or does it compliment you? Sorry, let me rephrase. Would it bother you or would it compliment you if somebody said, I knew that was a B.D. Anklevich story without reading the, the title? The byline, you mean? Because the title would... The title shouldn't give it away. It's a, <laughs> a B.D. Anklevich joint. <laughs> um, I, I knew that that was a B.D. Anklevich story without reading the author's name. That might compliment... I guess it depends on the tone of voice that they say that in. If they say, I knew that was a... You know, with a kind of smile sound to their voice. Or they went, I knew that was a B.D. Anklevich story without even reading the byline. Well, we haven't gotten to our uh, triple word score stories, but I, I'm i trying to remember what happened when I read yours because I really liked it and I happened to talk to you that same day, but I didn't know which story was yours. And I think I told you about the story. I, oh, yes, like, how far have you gotten? I just read the story where this and it happened to be your story because I don't think I could tell that that was I think you. you figured it out by the end because my story had that word in it that I'd fornicate that word? No. <laughs> Although my I like to put that word in stories too, but that's not it. Um no, it had the word doppelganger in it. That was one of my oh, words. Oh right, and that gave it away. And Shoot. Okay. And I even joked on Facebook that the title of my story was going to be Doppelgangum Style. Oh, that's <laughs> That was a good title, I thought. And I mean, it's a very it would be dated even now. Yeah. And uh yeah, so I think when Doppelganger came out, you oh, you went, "Oh, was this your story, the one about it?" And then you said, "Oh, yeah, I like that one. That one's a good one." For once, and it wasn't shite. Yeah, I was surprised because usually you're like, oh, I knew that was a B.D. Anklevich story without even reading the byline. Okay, well, that's fair. <laughs> if I if I said that to you, then I said that to you. you. You would remember better. But I don't remember if you answered the question. Oh, what was the question, sir? If someone said, I knew that that was one of your stories even though it was published under a different person's name, or even though there was no author's name attached to it? I don't know. It's hard to say. Like I was saying, it depends on maybe their tone of voice, you know, whether it sounds like they like that and they're glad that they knew that it was my story, or if they're like, oh, I knew that was your story. Well, like all your stories are the same. Well, that's possible, but the, the idea that you have of a voice... Mm -hmm. Or that you have a certain tone or there's just something about what you write that people could identify. That, to me, seems flattering. That yeah. seems like a compliment. And recently, J.K. Rowling put out that book under a pseudonym. Cuckoo and un something. And unfortunately, yeah, the, the beans were spilled on that. But it would have been really interesting if somebody was reading it and saying, you know who this reminds me of? That would be really cool. But, you know, that ship has sailed we'll didn't never. even get a chance for somebody to do that like they did didn't it somebody did somebody do that to stephen king with his richard bachman books they did but he had been doing bachman stuff for a few years right and i remember in the introduction of the bachman books the old one the old intro the good introduction he said writers after they've been working for a, a while tend to have a, a voice or a certain style that people can pick up on and he likened it to Paul McCartney used to tell a story of going to bars or clubs incognito with the Beatles to try out new material um, with disguises on and stuff like that. And they would play new songs and the audiences always knew that it was the Beatles because of the way they played their instruments. Even when they tried to alter their voices where they knew that it was the Beatles. And he's like, you know, I think an author is much the same way. You know, if you if you've read them enough. You tend to pick up on, and maybe that's debatable. I mean, stuff for with you and me, our stuff isn't out there enough. I guess. Uh huh. 
And, and it's possible that I don't have a style except for lots of descriptions of crapping for people to say, oh, hey, that was one of yours. I knew it was one of yours. Uh huh. But I think it would be complimentary if somebody said, no, I knew that story. You know, you entered the story without your name, but I knew it was yours just because of the way it felt or the sense of the humor or the ending or you know, I, I don't know because you know, we have a mind and we have a place that we go when we try to create and I would imagine that that process is similar especially when you do it all the time you go to that same place a a toilet stall in your mind <laughs> you're drawing on a certain hemisphere a certain portion of your mind theater of the mind toilet, toilet stall, stall of the mind, mind. yeah uh, I can totally see that being a kind of, you know, what's his face? My buddy, <laughs> David uh, David Allen Greer from uh, the In Living Color. Close. I think he was probably Three the named least guy. appreciated member of the. Oh, not David Allen Greer. Yeah, uh, Dean Wesley Smith, I believe, is the one you always call my buddy. Um, well, other wherever than... you go, he goes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he said that a lot about writing with, I think it's a sacred cows, killing the sacred cows of publishing. He did a whole series of essays on that where uh, he was taking myths, you know, that people held, hold up as sacred cows and saying, no, this isn't real and killing the cow that was sacred. But uh, anyways, yeah, he's talked about authors having their voice what is special and interesting about them their personality and he says you know that that comes out when you write your st- you know you go to the toilet stall in your mind or whatever and you go there and you and you get things from the toilet stall that's not so good yeah i mean and you put those on paper and he he would try and deter people from over editing from rewriting and rewriting and rewriting because he says that when you know when you write you're in that creative part you're in the toilet stall of your mind but when you're editing you have left the stall washed your hands and walked out and you're riding up and down the escalators or something you're not in the toilet stall yeah you're in the critical part of your mind and it, and when you start messing with the words that you put in there too much it will remove your voice from your stuff and make it sound like it could be anybody instead of uniquely you, which is kind of an interesting thing. I don't know uh, about that because I'm too close to my own stuff. You know what I mean? One thing that we've commented on time and time again about my writing is no answer. (laughs) Remember, anytime there was a story where I'd say you would always draw attention to it. Hey, guess what? No answer. <laughs> yeah, I always like to do that anytime I call you on your cell phone and you don't answer. When the answering machine comes on and it goes through and then it goes beep and I go, no answer. And then I just hang up. And yeah, I don't know if that's an insult or just that's something that I like. You know, we've talked about that a bunch of times and I talk about it all the time in an empty room where no one else can hear me. Huh. that I touch on the same themes over and over and over again because things that are really interesting to me. And yeah, that's one of the things is, hello, is someone else here? No answer. I yeah, well, I it, just dig on saying <laughs> no answer. It's a good way to say it. You know, it's not something that is bad, so I don't think it's a problem. It works. So keep it up, man. More no answers. Well, I will. I, I think... This has been an interesting experiment. We haven't done this before, have we, on the show? Two sharing our two stories, yours and mine, that have something similar? I don't think so. The closest, I guess, would be this year's uh, Halloween thing, where we each wrote a story about something that wasn't scary, trying to make it scary. But this is what we do with the Broken Mirror events before we did them as a, as a contest on the show. It's just... Let's both write something about this. And uh, it's fun to compare and contrast and fun to say this is what I learned about me or what I learned about you or what I hope I conveyed. And so if people dug this, we can always do it again. We're always trying to share our work, even though sometimes it's still scary for me. Yeah, but the more you do it, the more you build up those calluses. So Rich Outfield story next week, too. Yay! Said no one at all. (laughs) 
<laughs> said no one ever. Isn't that what they usually put on those uh, internet postcard things? <laughs> That's right. That's funny. Okay, hey, I want to thank Tyler Privet for producing this episode. I'm sorry that it was so much work, but uh, now you know what B.D. Anglovich did for the first two years of our show. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Tyler, for putting that show together. And thanks to your entire family for voicing it for us and a couple of your friends as well. It was well done. And uh, we'd love to have you back to do another story if you're willing. Yeah, we could do a shorter story. Yeah, we got lots of those. Or one that's insanely long and written by Jam Perkins. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody, and I uh, hope you have a great whatever week, month, year until we see you again. That's right. Hey, make sure you, you wash your hands. Yes, please. Seriously. Although that guy wasn't actually using the toilet. He was just sitting on it. Spoilers. What? I thought that was over. <laughs> Nothing is over. <laughs> Nothing. Good night. From the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine, thanks for listening. The Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So please share our show with everyone you know, but don't alter the files or try to sell them. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Take two. Gerald entered the stall and closed it behind him. Was Rex Stevens writing something in here? That was odd. Relief came quickly for Gerald Kapler. <laughs> what do they say when, when the monsters walk in the door at Harryhausen's? Is it some Japanese thing, or what is it that they say? They're like, Get back here, I don't know. Let's see if the... Oh, <laughs> no, it's not important, internet dude. internet can tell us. I want to open the episode with it, if it's possible. Why? What does it have to do with House of Ideas? Nothing. But it came to mind. Harry Housens? What was her name? Celia. Do you remember that part where... Billy Harry Christus Housens, says, but it's impossible to get a reservation there. Not for Googly Bear. <laughs> Remember that part where he goes, none of that matters now. I said, no, none, none of it matters. I'll never see Celia again. Doesn't that matter? And he's just like, F you. That scene has always been like, wow, dude. And I'm sure every parent in the world is like, yeah, F you. But every non-parent is like, wow, dude. Well, I guess we've never shared that with anyone. I was going to say this is more like our stories, but they are on, what is the site called? Amazon.com. Are they on Amazon? Is that where they are? Okay, they're on Amazon. I was going to say Smashwords, but I couldn't remember the name off the top of my head until now. Um, but they're not on Smashwords. They're on Amazon. By the time this episode airs, will you have anything on Smashwords? Maybe. I may well have lots of things on. Really? Well, that was one of your goals. It's possible. Did anybody try to uh, inspire you or encourage you or insurrect you <laughs> when you mentioned that, that you were going to put stuff on Smashwords? No, no, no one would do that. Oh, that's not cool. Mostly they said die and soon, please. All right. Well, um, <laughs> your, your fans are the same quality as mine. <laughs> What did he say about this, uh, the experience? It sucked. <laughs> well, I guess we're not going to go on any longer because we always, we always go on too long at the start. So we'll jump to the story and... Oh, you couldn't hear it. It was a fart. Oh, good, good. I thought you had something worthwhile to say before we well, went we to the We used to record our farts. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll jump straight into the story 
And uh, then we'll come back and tell you what Tyler actually said about the experience of producing a Dune Steve episode. It, it rhymed with pappy. <laughs> and I wasn't happy. Oh. Uh, um, we were referring to, uh, well, we talked about it last time. The, the, I called it the house, right? What did you call it? No, you called it the monitor. And I never did have a title for it. Okay, sorry. So, again, if you didn't listen to last episode, go back and listen to it, like we were about to do when we finished with this one. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Is there a way to make it bigger? You just got to get some lubricant and <laughs> kind of rub on it for a while. I want to make the page wider, too, right? Hey! It's a little skulls. It's not even a scary story, but it has skulls at the end. <laughs> I had no memory of the skulls. House O Ideas by Richelieu Benjamin Outfield. And I farted. Yeah. I figured as much. <clears throat> As the stall door opened, Gerald felt a bit embarrassed. As the stall door opened... <laughs> Why the farting sound? Because it's the, toilet related? No, just because I did a crappy job on that line. He moved past him, and Gerald noticed he had a... And Gerald noticed he had a mead notebook to... Uh, farting. Sometimes I have a hard time. It feels like it's been longer since I've narrated something. Then You should do it normal. professionally for no money at all like I do. That's a good idea. Gerald entered the stall and closed it behind him. Was Rex Stevens writing something in here? That was odd. Relief came quickly for Gerald Kapler. <laughs> Are you producing this one? I can see you doing like a 20 second long. <laughs> just let it go and go. Just nasty sound effect. It's all sloppy, plopping into the toilet. You can hear Gerald gasping and it's crying. Like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's terrible. He's actually going, oh. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so terrible. <sighs> That's awful. <laughs> we'll have to at least in include that as an outtake. <laughs> Relief came quickly for Gerald Kapler. <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring down the room a little bit here, everybody. Okay. Here's a nice little ditty by Paula Abdul. Rush, rush, hurry, hurry, love, come to me. Uh. On Sunday, I met my idol, Rhett, Rex Stevens. That same day, I write the best, I write the best story ever. Fate. I'm going to remember this day. Skull. Why skull? <laughs> I don't know. It must be some weird font thing where it puts that in in oh, place of... Oh, you think it wasn't originally a skull, but it no, got translated it was into something it? else, and yeah, it became a skull because it doesn't have that character or something. Cool. So Gerald P. Kapler, the P sounded better for a published writer, had found his muse. And if it happened to be made of porcelain, no one was the wiser. Skull! Skull! No, there's two skulls. Two skulls! You will die. <laughs> That's what it's telling you. <laughs> a businessman stepped into the bathroom and stopped when he saw the line. Gerald thought the guy looked like a very young Hitler, complete with a chaplain mustache, only taller and thinner and blonder. Nobody has a chaplain mustache. Come on, man. Sorry. Uh, so long gone. <clears throat> I also said laptop computer. I wonder if nowadays you'd even have to say computer. It's just a laptop, right? 
Got to be clear, man. People might be confused. They might think that they actually he actually has someone's lap in his hand, the top of it. It's a sex toy of some sort. Yes. When he opened the stall door and walked past the three men standing there, his mind was so filled with thoughts for his novel, he wished he had brought a tape recorder with him. Skull! 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 You will die! <laughs> <laughs> when we do the actual episode for this, <clears throat> we got to find out what symbol that was that got translated to skull. <laughs> I'm assuming it's either a star or it's usually stars a that pound. I, use. I don't know if you use I usually use the pound sign myself, but I like stars. Stars are good. A twenty-something with a poorly grown goatee and three piercings in his face. Excuse me, how long is the restroom closed? The employee stepped away from the row of Atlas Shrugged and sighed theatrically. Gerald caught sight of another piercing in his tongue. I don't know. Stop asking me. Dude, help me out of here and I'll totally make it worth, it, worth your while. <laughs> Sound is, sounds good. Eh? Snake. It's the Simpsons dude. It's Snake, <laughs> I think is his name. They have what I saw not too long ago where they solved the budget crisis by putting uh, prisoners from the uh, penitentiary in uh, the school using like the extra space in the school. And so like Snake is right behind Bart and Principal Skinner's like, maybe this will scare the, the naughty one straight. And then you see Snake standing behind Bart and he's like, dude, help me out of here and I'll totally make it worth your while. And Bart's like, I'm listening. <laughs> uh. Chupa. The manager could not have looked at him more disgustedly. Get out, he said through clenched teeth. Skull, 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 skull. You will die. <laughs> But nothing came. No concepts, no settings, no characters, no morals, no plots, not even a joke. He let his breath out. Go. Let your breath out. <sighs> he spat into the toilet and walked out. Of the hey. He sneezed into the toilet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are you all right? Uh, yeah, these chairs just aren't the comfortable chairs that they never have been. That's right. You're going to have a new house, though. It's going to have chairs designed for podcasting. <laughs> They're exactly the same as regular chairs. They just charge a tiny bit more. Yeah, not even a tiny bit. Double. He thought about it, about what would drive someone to kill in a public restroom. And if... No! Yes, sir, yes. Dang. Three bags full. That dang baby's going to start crying because of your fart. Wait, wait a minute. What's there now? A wall. No, there was a door. There was a door. It said, The, the Pusher. Please. She sighed. <sighs> You're not her. It's an employee restroom, douche. She eyed him evilly. If you need a place to piss, it's on the first floor, son of a bitch. Yeah, just the the Midwestern voice doesn't fit with it now, how nasty <laughs> she is. In fact, you've been much nicer than I imagined this woman being. Gerald smiled big. This one came a little easier. Could I get an application, please? He asked. Skull! The end! Skull! You will die! Say the end normally just so they might be able to use it. We never do that, though. We just have... Authors! No! We don't include the end in our no. episode. We've been doing 140 of them and we've never said the end? Nope. It always Sometimes finishes. Sometimes we say end! Yeah. It always finishes, and then 
the music fades out, and then announcer man says author's note, and then somebody reads an author's note, and then the music for Dune Steve comes up, and then and the end, and we're back, which I couldn't <laughs> despise more. Uh, maybe we should ask announcer man who is dead to. Uh, <laughs> To, add, to record, to record the, the end. end. Why? Just because I love the end. It should always be there. You are. All right. The end. Wait, that's the end? You bastard. <laughs> the end. A skull. Skull. If you you will die. die. There is nothing we won't try. Never heard the word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Cut it out.